What's up, everybody? Welcome into another YouTube live show. I am John Kurtz. We are doing this damn thing on a Monday, okay? Last night, we were all watching the NCAA tournament. I did not want to pull you away from that. Frankly, I did not want to pull myself away from that either. So uh, I thought it made a lot more sense to just come on here today and get our live fix in on a Monday. I know it is also a little bit earlier than I would normally do it as well. So Monday at 7 o'clock, not the typical streaming time. Totally understand if you're a little bit caught off guard by this. Uh, but I hope that you will uh, be okay with it. I hope we can still have some fun because we've still got plenty going on in the ACC. We might as well be calling this thing as the ACC turns. And today, we turn a lot of our attention to Miami because there have been comments made not only by the leadership at the University of Miami, but also somebody who covers the program very closely, and they brought up the Big 12 with the Miami Hurricanes. Now, I don't want this to be a show where we all get our hopes up way too high, those of us that are Big 12 folks and, and would enjoy seeing that happen, which I would certainly count myself among those. I would love if the Big 12 could add Miami at some point in time. I don't know that that's the most likely outcome by any stretch of the imagination, but it was at least brought up by somebody close to the program and they laid out kind of what the path would be if that were going to happen. So very much worthy of discussion, especially in light of the fact that like, I don't know what is going on at Miami behind the scenes, but their public posturing has not been very aggressive. Everything that they're doing publicly does not seem to be very aggressively trying to get out of the ACC. It is very much not like Florida state and Clemson. And it does not even seem to match the same urgency that like North Carolina has, even while they're being bogged down a little bit by the governance of their board. Um, so I'm curious what's actually happening at Miami. If it is what is being said publicly, or if there is more actually to the story, but uh, we will certainly discuss all of that. Not just what was said about the big 12 by the program insider, but what has been said by leadership at the university of Miami. Jack Swarbrick, who is the outgoing athletic director at Notre Dame, he did what Dennis Dodd called an exit interview with him at CBS Sports. And there were a couple of comments of note there, one about Notre Dame's current status and how likely it is that they would ever join a conference. And he also spoke about the ACC, which, of course, Notre Dame has the agreement with the ACC, not playing in their football conference, but they have plenty of their sports in the league. So he knows a thing or two about what's going on down there, and it did not seem very optimistic from him if you are a Florida State or a Clemson fan about uh, your your fight here trying to get out. Uh, he kind of acknowledged the reality of that, which to him is not the reality that I think a lot of Florida State and Clemson fans see right now. Hey, we all love crapping on Greg Sankey, right? And if we do want to talk some NCAA tournament, uh, we can all take turns doing that because it did not work out really well for uh, Greg Sankey immediately after saying that too many of these Automatic bids are being given out to the, you know, lower tier conferences, non power six conferences and college hoops. And we need to we need to be giving more to the, uh, you know, 500 teams in power five conferences didn't work out well is right after that. Of course, Kentucky loses to Oakland. The SEC did not have really a great opening weekend at the uh, NCAA tournament. So we can get to that. There was also. An actual good point made by Peter Burns, who has kind of turned into Baghdad Bob for the SEC. He actually made a good, uh, I would say, a compromise, a solution that is a compromise between expanding the NCAA tournament and not hurting it too much, not messing with the automatic bids. Because if one thing is for certain, I mean, the way the tournaments have been going, I know it's not a super crazy Sweet 16, but it's still been really fun, lots of great finishes and lots of cool underdog stories to the first two rounds it's not something that needs to be touched uh we don't need to be doing that although as big 12 fans we got to be careful because brett yormark is somebody who definitely seems to support this idea as well anyway that's what i've got uh in essence on the outline today maybe i'm forgetting one thing oh yes the pac-12 we'll see if we get to the pac-12 you know at one point this was as the pac-12 turns now it's turned into as the acc turns the pac-12 got a settlement done the numbers are out on that, and I, I tell you what, Wazoo and Oregon State have actually come out of this thing looking pretty good, at least from a financial standpoint, based on what the expectation may have been. Uh, so we can talk about that and uh, the money, the money that uh, Kirk Schultz and company will be rolling around in that they're going to get from everybody else. I, I was happy to see pretty good deal, it would appear, um, and just a pretty good like 10-day run. 
for Washington State and Oregon State and everybody associated with the Pac-12, two, whatever we're going to call it now, moving forward. But that's what I have. You guys know you can be a part of the show tonight if you want to be on. You can submit your question or comment by clicking the dollar sign below the chat box in order to be a part of the show that will attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat, ensures that you make it on tonight. I could not do it without all of you guys' support, you guys that do that. I much appreciate it. Uh, seriously, could not do it without you guys. And uh, I really do appreciate those of you who do. It's a way for you to weigh in tonight. You can control the content and make your voice be heard, voice your opinion. Um, easy way to do so. Click the dollar sign below the chat box in order to do that. Also, if you want to give a totally free support, little nod of support to the channel, uh, you can do that by just clicking the like button. It is one simple click, everybody. That's all it takes is one click, and you can support the channel as well. Uh, if you leave a comment in the comment section of the video, also underneath the video, that would be very helpful as well. Do you think this is crazy? Is it totally crazy to even be discussing Miami uh, to the Big 12? I, I try not to peddle in like the crazy realignment theories here, but because this has been brought up by somebody that uh, appears to be reputable, story on on three, uh, I am going to discuss it here today. So let me know what you think in the comments. And if you are not watching live and you want another way to support the channel and be a part of things, you can contribute to the channel on Venmo. It is John dash Kurtz dash four on Venmo in order to do that. And if you submit your donation there, along with a question or comment, I will read it on the next show. And that is where we start tonight with my good friend, Clint. Appreciate you, Clint. Uh, Clint says, disappointed about my Cougs in the tournament. Man, I was too. I, I watched most of that game. Valiant effort, valiant comeback, but not quite enough, man. It was tough. It tough sledding for BYU in March once they got to, um, uh, well, I guess was the KU win in March. Maybe it wasn't all tough sledding, but it was certainly tough sledding in, in the postseason. Uh, not a great showing at the Big 12 tournament. And then obviously a rough first round loss in the NCAA tournament as well. Uh, Clint says, watch Kansas Gonzaga, and I'm thinking the Big 12 should add Gonzaga and UConn. Uh, having to add UConn football, fine, because those basketball programs are overall additive. Then Duke and Louisville, uh, subscriptions, brands, competitive, fun. Well, that you just outlined like the, the best case scenario for the basketball that, that could ever happen in this conference. And it's funny, it must be just because it's tournament time, but I've had a couple people ask me about gonzaga here recently and like is that dead are we done with the gonzaga thing or like how how far down that road is the big 12 still is it totally off the road are we just parked somewhere what's going on truthfully i i don't know it did seem like something that obviously had a lot more support from brett yormark than it did the presidents and other leadership around the conference that were a little bit more skeptical about that I mean, it seems like the yukon thing is dead that was being talked about a lot before the four corners came on board and with UConn, it was not just, Hey, would the big 12 add them? It was also with the big, uh, would the Huskies want to move their basketball out of the big East. So that felt like there were so many more roadblocks to it, but when you see how they're playing and they're the defending champs and now they're just rolling people again, looking like, man, all right. Gonzaga makes the sweet 16 every year. Here's UConn looking like a dominant force again. We've already been talking about, John, the ACC imploding and potentially Duke and Louisville being there as basketball brands for Brett Yormark to pick up. So, like, we could really put together a super-duper conference in, in basketball and have your own version of what's going on in, in football with the SEC and, uh, and the Big Ten. And maybe that's one way to kind of fight back a little bit. Maybe Brett Yormark still has that pinned up on a board somewhere in a, in a meeting room in Dallas. And that's the ultimate plan. I don't know. I guess when I picture that, I picture like Charlie from Always Sunny, the, the gift that always goes around, the little clip of him, like the crime scene uh, thing going on on the wall. Maybe maybe Brett Yormark is still working on that, massaging that. I think Duke and Louisville, out of all the brands, uh, all the teams, schools that you just listed off there, Clint, are, are certainly the most likely in all of this, at least until I hear Gonzaga pop up again, which it popped up, kind of went away, popped back up. Now it's kind of gone away again. Seems like there's always been some level of flirtation there, but I, I do think that I do think that Duke and Louisville could be very much realistic possibilities based on everything that is happening in the ACC right now. So keep your eyes peeled to that. And we know, you know, clearly the idea with the Big Twelve is your way to be as relevant as you possibly can right now is in large part through basketball. 
build the best basketball brand that you can maximize it. That is why Brett Yormark has pushed for tournament expansion. He wants to get his league in there as much as possible, get the extra money that you get from the units in the NCAA tournament from winning games, all of those things. He's, he's kind of trying to follow the same sort of plan that like the SEC and Big Ten have done to uh, to leverage football. So anyway, good thoughts. Good thoughts, Clint. And I, I would love it if, if the Big 12 had that basketball conference. I mean, just have some fun here. Fantasize a little bit. Duke, Louisville, Gonzaga, UConn, Kansas, Baylor, um, Houston. Like, I mean, boy, we just rattled off, what, seven? Like seven of the top maybe 10 to 15 basketball programs out there right now. Uh, that's pretty crazy. And then you've got like a next tier Iowa state, Texas tech, uh, you know, K state has certainly had moments. Like there, there are a number of other teams there, BYU, your Cougs, you know, um, programs that are also very good that fit in there is kind of like a second tier. So a lot that you could do with that. Anyway, Clint, appreciate your support. If you want to be like Clint, it's John dash Kurtz dash four. Uh, on Venmo, if you want to weigh in there. Okay, so I'm going to read you uh, the Miami article. It is from Brad Crawford of 24-7 Sports. It is not just him commenting here, though. He talked to Inside the U's David Lake, and that is where some of the Big 12 discussion starts. But we begin with some of the comments uh, from Miami's leadership, and that being Miami AD Dan Radakovich. So the story says Miami will not join Clemson and Florida State in respective legal battles against the ACC in an effort to leave the conference. Miami AD Dan Radakovich said the ACC is on great footing and does not concern himself with what other forward-facing programs in the conference are doing. So that's an interesting paragraph in and of itself. And I'm, we're going to get to some quotes from him here. I've now read actually quite a bit that he has said, and all of it has been very much, we're sticking by our man. Like, we're standing by our man. And our man is the ACC. We are not going to publicly admonish the ACC. We're not going to publicly say like, hey, look at this widening gap. We've got to be keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know what exactly it is because I would say, well, Florida State has the more direct pressure with Florida in the SEC. Their arch rival, Clemson, South Carolina, the same deal. But I don't know. I mean, Miami's still got to deal with Florida. They still have to deal with Florida, too. They're still competing with Florida, too. I, I am just surprised that Miami has not come out with a more bullish stance on this. I don't know if that's just um, something about Miami, like accepting their plot in life a little bit more right now as a, as a program that just realistically has not been very good on the field for a very long time. Certainly not what they're expected to be i'm not sure exactly what that is or if it is all just a complete cover and they prefer to move more uh under like cloak and dagger as as greg would say or i'm not entirely sure what the strategy would be there why they would want to go that way if it is what they're going to do because they, they kind of have some cover for it like you could publicly come out and say like yeah we don't really love where this is going we need the acc to figure something out or we're gonna have to evaluate our options and you're going to be like the fourth most important person on that list that people are paying attention to. And like, if people are going down like the, oh man, like this is just crazy that they're doing it. You're going to be like fourth on that list of like crazy people doing crazy things here. Florida state's way out in front. Clemson then is also Clemson's also involved in a lawsuit. I mean, for God's sake, there are two schools already involved in lawsuits with the con conference. And then you've got North Carolina, which has also not been shy about speaking about the future. Uh, instead, Miami is preferring to uh, to take it very, very subtle, uh, I guess I would I would say. Or not even really that. They're just being outright supportive of the conference. Here's a quote from Dan Radakovich. Quote, we are incredibly solid with the ACC. It's a great conference and provides great structure and uh, certainly access to the college football playoff. <laughs> okay. Provides college football playoff access. Uh, we look at our circumstance here with a very orange and green set of glasses and ask, are we in a good spot and growing our football program? We're invested in it. We brought Mario Cristobal here and he's establishing an incredible foundation. What's the opportunity for us here with things under our control to move this thing forward? The ACC is still one power four conference that's a part of the college football playoff. Well, I guess if I really wanted to nitpick this quote, I would attack what's the opportunity for us here with things under our control to move this thing forward. What's the opportunity for us here with things under our control to move this thing forward? I would say 
the only real way to move your thing forward with things under your control is to try to get out of the ACC because that, to me, that's the part that you can't control now. Like the Big 12 and the ACC are stuck in this world where what they cannot control is the widening gap between them and the SEC and the Big 10. There's just not much that you can do about it at this point. You are kind of stuck. And so if you want to do something, it's about maneuvering your way out of it if you have options, which not very many of the schools in either of those two conferences legitimately have options right now. And Miami actually might not. Maybe that's some of this too. Maybe as I talk through this, maybe some of it is trying to back channel and posture and figure out if there's actually a landing spot there, if you could get loose. But again, I would counter that and say, you can, you can just draft off of Florida state and Clemson here. You don't have to be sticking your neck out or going out on a limb. You can just draft off of those two. All it is right now is a waiting game to see what happens with the litigation going on between Florida state Clemson and the ACC. You can just sit back and wait. I guess maybe that's the thought. We sit back and wait. No need to upset the apple cart because if they leave, the dam breaks loose and we'll all be able to go anyway. And we'd prefer not to rock the boat. But if we want to take this quote literally, what's the opportunity for us here with things under our control to move this thing forward? Your chance to move forward is by somehow finding a way out of the ACC. And that's about it. Um, Radakovich would go on to say, we're very proud to be a part of that. We're a leading brand within the ACC and we're going to continue to be a part of it. Uh, those dollar differentials aren't going to change the path of how we're going to move forward as an organization. The complete and total opposite of how Florida state took this Florida state took this and said, we're going to open up board meetings and we're going to talk about how crappy this conference is and how they have done us wrong by the amount of money that we're taking in. And we need to publicly shame them. We're going to publicly shame them. Meanwhile, on the other side, Miami says, eh, those dollar differentials aren't going to change how we're going to move forward. We're just still going to do our thing. Uh, pretty crazy, the stark difference there. Radakovich says, we're a program that's moving forward. As a university, we're moving forward and on the rise, both academically and other areas. Uh, again, I would argue if you are a program or a school that is going to be on the rise in the realignment world, you're going to do that by moving up to the Big Ten of the SEC. There's no other way to go. That is literally the one way uh, to move up right now. Radakovich says, uh, so Radakovich is not confident Clemson or Florida State will be able to get out of the ACC's grant of rights and leave the conference early. If the Tigers and Seminoles are successful, would the Hurricanes then look to move? Here's where the tone will change at least a little bit. Um, but this is coming from now David Lake. That's the problem here. We're, we're no longer speaking to the athletic director at the University of Miami. We're now talking to David Lake from inside the U. Uh, but the question posed in the article is, would the Hurricanes look to move if the ACC lawsuit is unsuccessful against Clemson and Florida State? If Clemson and Florida State win the legal battle? Quote, that is, uh, this is difficult to predict from a Miami standpoint. Inside the U's, David Lake told 24-7 Sports, this is a big game of musical chairs, and the question for Miami is how many spots in the big two remain. Among ACC programs, Florida State and Clemson are the two biggest brands, and they are being the most aggressive. They will likely eat first. Where does Miami stand in the pecking order amongst the remaining schools? Miami is banking on a winning 2024 season, translating to making themselves more desirable to the big two conferences. Miami certainly hasn't been aggressive enough at this point to make any definitive prediction. Boy, there I mean, there's a lot there. He he is totally right. Like they're not, they're not very high up the priority list here but they have, a, they have a puncher's chance. And that's why I'm surprised they have not been more aggressive. If you feel like you have a puncher's chance, you should be pretty darn aggressive at this point. They are going to be behind for sure Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina. No doubt about that in the ACC. Uh, Virginia, I think a lot of people would argue that Virginia would be a more desirable option, certainly for the SEC uh, to add to get a different state, a highly populated state in their conference. So they're going to be behind them. I mean, I'm looking at them as probably like a 4A, 4B, or maybe number five in the pecking order there in that conference. So are there enough spots there? You you would have to, this would have to be a pretty big expansion job by the Big Ten and the SEC if Miami is going to find a seat at the table there. But so many of these schools, like they have crazy egos in this situation. I'm just surprised that Miami doesn't have more of an ego, especially because we've got 30 for thirties about them. Like the U that, that was a real big thing that got them a lot of popularity. I kind of fell in love with Miami a little bit after the U documentaries came out, 
they've got a lot of cachet built up in that, but they don't seem to uh, to peddle the same sort of ego that like a Florida State, which you know certainly is one of the biggest brands, if not the biggest brand in the ACC, but also had fallen on some harder times recently and probably hadn't lived up to that billing, yet they still had 1,000% the ego, you know, 200% at least the ego uh, of what they probably should have had. But here's the quote about the Big 12, okay? And again, this is not from the athletic director. This is not from somebody directly in the athletic department, right? This is David Lake who covers Miami for Inside the U. He said, quote, Miami's leadership needs a kick in the pants, frankly. And unless they change their approach, I could foresee the Big 12 being a landing spot. Hopefully, athletic director Dan Radakovich and the Miami leadership start being proactive and make sure they have a seat at the table in the game of musical chairs for the migration to the Big Two sooner rather than later. And the big thing that I would try to push here if I were Miami and just play off of as much as possible. Again, Florida state is going to be ahead of you in the pecking order, but I would just be throwing myself at the big 10 saying, Hey, look, like you want in Florida, we're in Florida. We are a recognizable brand that does have some cachet and we're in the state of Florida, man. Come get us, like get yourself into the state of Florida. Let's do it. Um, that's what I would be pushing as much as possible if I were Miami, but that just, does not seem to be at least publicly and according to uh, what is being said here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting the guy's name. David Lake. David Lake says that they need a kick in the pants. It seems like they're not doing enough of this. Like advocate for yourself. Like we're in Florida, you know, if, if the, if the Florida state's going to flirt with the sec, we're here, baby. We're here. We'll make it happen. Or you want, you want a double, double headed, Presence in the state of Florida, come get us and Florida State. Like, throw us both in there to the Big Ten. That is what I would be doing. And so it makes sense then that the scenario laid out after that in the article is it was discussed last summer. The Big Ten badly wanted a program in Florida to compete with the SEC uh, on fertile recruiting soil and for added national attention. At least that's the way one source put it. Uh, Miami was one of the handful of ACC programs the Big Ten initially considered in 2022 during the realignment extravaganza joining Florida State and UNC. So, of course, this would have been back in the USC-UCLA era. Uh, with the conference already widening its reach last year to California with the USC and UCLA editions, stretching deep into Florida seems like a no-brainer. Miami just wants out of the ACC, period. And one source said previously, uh, or period, one source said previously, but that's not what Radakovich has said on record. There is a fear among those close to the Miami program. This is another big one. There is a fear among those close to the Miami program that if the Big Ten only seeks out Florida State and Notre Dame during its next round of expansion, Miami would be left without its top choice in future realignment. And that's, look, legitimate fear. I, I would think if I'm Miami, I'm thinking all of this in context of the Big Ten. Like It doesn't make nearly as much sense for the SEC who is already in Florida to be wanting to scoop up Miami. Miami is going to play second fiddle to Florida or Florida state, whoever is there. I would be very worried about that. Like Florida state gets the spot in the big 10. If expansion is not going to go just like all the way out and we're going to make two just giant leagues and have like 45 teams between the two of them, then you probably are going to get left out at that point. Then you would have to assess the landscape and assess your options. And we're talking about a scenario there where FSU is out. I guess Notre Dame is out. We're going to have more on Notre Dame coming up in just a moment in the show. But if those schools are out, Clemson presumably, I guess, in this scenario would be in the SEC. Dam's broken on the ACC thing. So you theoretically, by legal precedent, would be able to get out. I mean, you're, you're going to have to be steered toward the Big 12, basically. Like, there's not really much of a choice left. <laughs> You would, they would be all of a sudden one of the four corner schools, probably more in the vein of like a Utah that's not happy about where they're having to go, but that would really be the landing spot. So I, I do see where the fear comes from and where the scenario is that kind of outlines how that would happen, that Miami would wind up there. Very interesting to see it laid out by somebody who's covering Miami and, and close to it. Now, would I come out and tell you that I think this is, a really likely scenario? No, probably not. And there still would be a moment of like, all right, if Miami is really legitimately available, are the Big Ten and the SEC going to both let Miami pass with another 
pretty big brand in the state of Florida. Would they let that completely float away? Even if it's like, you know, you could take Miami now that we have a precedent set of like reduced revenue share coming in, reduced money that you're getting from the TV contracts, not just with SMU, but you now have it with Oregon and Washington. Wouldn't you maybe do that? Yes, I, I could see something like that happening if if they are truly out there because the ACC is completely exploded. There is also the possibility of what we discussed. I don't remember if that was on the last show or two shows ago, but the discussion that was had about the zombie conference forming within the ACC, uh, the ACC kind of cutting the fat, in essence, winning a legal battle, busting everything all up, and then coming back together with the only programs that feel like everybody feels like anyway would be worth their weight and you could up the amount of money that's coming in per school. Uh, that's that's another scenario that could play out too. So I still would not say that it is in any way, shape or form the most likely scenario, but I think there is a possibility here and it's it's laid out how exactly that could happen. And if people that are close to the Miami program really think the leadership means, uh, quote, a kick in the pants, I, I wouldn't feel right about that if I were if I were Miami. Uh, I would, I, they have enough to leverage, I guess I'll put it that way. Like, look, I'm a, I'm a K state fan, man. And as much as I think K state punches above its weight class and has done some really good things in athletics, I, I still get frustrated when I see like a Miami and I'm like, dude, you, you guys have so much more of a national brand in the state of Florida and all these things to be able to leverage, go leverage it, do it, be aggressive. You should be right now because everybody can see the writing on the wall in the ACC, except, except apparently Jack Swarbrick, the outgoing AD at Notre Dame, who I'm going to get to in, in just a moment, um, who had some comments to uh, Dennis Dodd that would seem to butt up against anybody who thinks Florida State and Clemson are going to be really successful with this. But as I mentioned, if you guys want to be a part of the show, uh, control content tonight, make your voice heard, click the dollar sign below the chat box to attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat. Uh, we'll pin it in a separate column, make sure that it gets on the show here tonight. So I am going to get to a couple super chats here in just a moment. Sincerely appreciate you guys who do that. I, I could not do this every single week without you guys. So I really, truly do appreciate it. If you could like the video, that's an easy free way to support the channel as well. Just one click, like that video helps the YouTube algorithm. Leave a comment underneath the video. How realistic do you think it is that uh, Miami could wind up in the Big 12? All of that stuff, great way to help. And of course, john kurtz 4 as well on Venmo if you want to be like Clint and uh, leave your question or comment there with your donation, and I will read it on the next show. All right, Colson. What's up, Colson? Uh, Colson says, Blizzard here in Fargo. Uh, th thoughts on climate offseason? Little K-State football question there. Well, first of all, sorry about the blizzard. I have been to Fargo once. I was once offered a job in Fargo uh, in like 2015. 2016. I think it was 2016. Um, definitely heavily considered it. Uh, climate off season. I think, I think it's been pretty good. Um, obviously losing Colin Klein is a concern, but I'm optim cautiously optimistic about what they did. And that is not just hiring Matt Wells as the quarterback coach and co-offensive coordinator, but also promoting Connor Riley to the offensive coordinator. Um, I don't think it's really fair to judge a ton from like the bowl game, but it seemed to go fine. Um, offensively, I, I, I have some concerns about all of that. Matt Wells helps a lot being that he's a guy that not only has obviously been a coordinator, but has been a head coach at the power five level. And all the reports that I've been hearing out of spring ball are just that like Avery Johnson's that dude, they are legitimately pretty darn good, but maybe a little bit thin at quarterback. So they're, they're probably going to hit the portal. I would think for a backup quarterback uh, coming up in spring, which it's going to be a crazy portal season. They're also going to have to just hang on to their guys um, because that's been talked about a lot by like Josh Pate is really starting to gear everybody up for that. Watch out what happens in the spring portal uh, with people being poached now that there's, there's no one-time transfer rule, but yeah, I mean, I think all things considered, it's been all right. I, I would like to see them do a little bit more in the portal in the spring, which it sounds like they'll have the opportunity to do. I would like them to shore up the defensive line a little bit more now that it looks like, well, Malcolm Alcorn Crowder is, is not going to make it. It was one of their bigger Juco additions uh, to the class. Unfortunately, academic issues, it sounds like is not going to get him here. So that sucks. That's a blow. I would like them to, uh, 
just go tack on three or four more guys in the in the spring portal, but it sounds like that'll be pretty pretty realistic to do. Um, I feel good. I feel good. Hope that uh, hope that gives you enough a little taste. Uh, pay attention to Three Ma, the K State podcast. Obviously, I do with uh, Derek Young and Cole Manbeck. We'll have uh, we're planning on doing a football episode on Wednesday, so that'll get you a lot more in depth uh, football talk there too, Colson. But uh, appreciate you following along, my friend uh jody what's up jody thank you for being here thank you for your support of the channel jody says why is louisville not trying to get out so they can go to the big 12 uh isn't the big 12 better overall and long term uh i'm a florida state alum but from the ville awesome show i'm not big 12 but your show is the best hey thank you jody really really kind words and i appreciate that yeah i I mean, I think the for Louisville, it's probably like the Big 12 might be in some ways better for them. And frankly, a lot of people would look back on the period when the Big 12 really flirted with adding Louisville. Um, it wasn't the story. It was the story that David Boren at Oklahoma like wasn't on board with that. And that was a part of the reason that Louisville didn't get added when West Virginia and TCU came into the league. I can't remember specifically who that was, but I was thinking maybe that was like a David Bourne thing that he shut down. I could be wrong on that. Um, either way, it, it's almost happened before. And so Louisville may look at it and say, Hey, it'd be great for basketball. We would love to be in that basketball league. The ACC clearly is on its way out. It's going to implode, but it's just not where you don't need to get wrapped up in the legal battle, right? Like billable hours are expensive, Louisville's trying to go through hiring a basketball coach and making sure that they've got enough NIL to do that in addition to a salary for a coach and all that stuff. It's just not an expense. I think that you would want to take on when, again, kind of like what I talked about with Miami, like guys are already paving the way for you here. Like you've got an offensive line in front of you. The, the guys doing the dirty work up front are Florida State and Clemson and maybe to a lesser extent, North Carolina. They're clearing a hole for you. So you just kind of have to stand around and wait for them to do it. You know, be a patient runner. You don't need to run up into the defenders and try and knock them over yourself. Go watch Florida State and Clemson. See where they go and kind of follow them through. I think that's that's the play here as opposed to trying to, to jump the line and do it right now. Everybody else kind of can sit back and wait a little bit because Florida State and Clemson have taken this responsibility basically upon themselves, saying like this matters most to us because of the rivals that we have that are in the SEC in our states like we absolutely cannot stand for this and can't let this happen and we can't wait around for schools like miami that are gonna tiptoe around this a little bit more we cannot wait for them to decide to become more aggressive we need to be the aggressors here and so that's what's happened and so i think louisville may be looking at it like hey our future may well be in the big 12 but uh don't need to be in a rush to do it when you have people clearing the way because otherwise you're going to be fighting this insane legal battle and still having to go through the same thing that uh, FSU and Clemson are having to go through with the grant of rights and exit fees. And you know, I mean, a quote that was thrown out there by Florida state that it could cost upwards of $500 million uh, to get out. If, if none of the rulings go your way in court. So I think that's kind of the scenario, but I'm sure there are people at Louisville that may be looking at it like, yeah, the big 12 is probably our, our long-term future here. Uh, Jody, great to hear from you, my friend and love your perspective being uh, from ACC country in a couple different angles with Florida State and Louisville. Thank you for being here, and uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, if anybody else has anything, click the dollar sign below the chat box to weigh in tonight uh, to create a super chat, attach a donation to your chat, and hop on the show. Like the video, would really appreciate that, and leave me a comment in the comment section. What do you think about Miami to the Big 12? Uh, before I get to Jack Swarbrick, there were a couple other comments here. Um, Radakovich, the AD at Miami, had some other comments that I pulled from a different article. Uh, here at the University of Miami, we are incredibly solid with the ACC. It's a great conference, provides great structure, access to the playoff, which is very, very important. We look at our circumstances here with a very green and orange set of glasses saying, are we in a good spot growing our football program? So a lot of very similar types of quotes uh, coming around here. He says, I really didn't see the Clemson lawsuit coming at this point in time, which that's the type of comment that I would have to say, like maybe take that one with a grain of salt and say he may be just uh, saying that for saving face in public. So because, you know, if he had been watching Greg Flugar's YouTube channel, he would have known that the Clemson lawsuit was coming. Right. So 
I'd imagine that he actually did. But he says every, quote, every, almost every school in the ACC has gone to the home office and looked at the documents and just made sure they understood all the different things associated with the grant of rights, television contracts. I was a little surprised that uh, Clemson did that at this point in time. But each of these circumstances are very, very local, whether you have constituencies on campus making a little more noise that we don't want to be in a circumstance where we are uh, at a disadvantage. I guess Clemson looked at that, said this is an important time to lessen exit fees uh, or attempt to eliminate the grant of rights. And uh, same with Florida State. So a couple more quotes that, again, if I were a Miami fan, like I would hate those. I would hate those and hope that that is just a public face and there's more going on behind the scenes, you know, more like I kind of like a duck, right? Like calm above the water, but the legs kicking like crazy under the water, but I'm not seeing any public comments from anybody suggesting that that is actually happening. So just a a little further context on uh, Miami and Radakovich, the AD and what may be going on there. So on the Notre Dame front, uh, Jack Swarbrick, longtime athletic director there. He is now the outgoing athletic director at Notre Dame. And he spoke to uh, Dennis Dodd from CBS Sports. And Dennis Dodd called this basically like an exit interview. There's a lot to it. Much of it not super interesting. I mean, you know, he Dodd says he would nominate Swarbrick for co-commissioner of college football along with Nick Saban, which like, Hey, I mean, if you want to do that, that'd be great. I think the sport would be far better off if there were a legitimate commissioner looking out for the good of the sport. Unfortunately, we don't have that. doesn't look like that's any sort of realistic possibility. So, you know, there's some stuff about that. There's more stuff specifically about Notre Dame, but these were the two bits that I thought were the most newsworthy out of it. Uh, This is a paragraph that was not just a part of the Q&A because Dodd did basically just include like a legitimate question and answer back and forth. Um, but this part was more editorialized by Dodd and it says in disparate times, Notre Dame can still look itself in the mirror as a university legitimately attempting to balance academics and athletics. It's football independence has never been more solid. Now that's, that's a strong statement. It's football independence has never been more solid because a lot of people are sitting around here. I might've just read you something about Miami people fearing that the worst case scenario is Florida state and Notre Dame get to the big 10 in the next round of realignment. And really just when there's so much realignment going on around you and college football playoff changing, like there's so many plates spinning and stuff changing that that feels like a tricky statement to make to me that their football independence has never been more solid, but worth noting, I suppose that that's, That's what Dodd is saying. Uh, Combining revenue from NBC and ESPN, uh, the latter through its scheduling partnership with the ACC, Notre Dame is believed to be making somewhere north of $60 million annually in media rights. Now, that's a pretty good number. And that was a a big piece of this. People saying, hey, Notre Dame needs to hit the number that it needs in order to be able to maintain its independence. And a lot of that was discussions with the new NBC contract and this number being thrown out there, if it really is north of $60 million, that's that's very competitive with the SEC and the Big Ten. And it is much better than the ACC and Big 12 being in the 30s. Now, when he says media rights, I'm like, okay, does that include... This is where you always... You do have to be careful because the 31.7, I believe that it was for the Big 12 with the TV deal, that's, that's not including college football playoff. And sometimes you'll see those numbers compared when it's the the number with the playoff money coming in and the TV revenue money. If we're talking strictly TV revenue, just strictly TV revenue and you're north of $60 million. Yeah, that's very competitive with the Big Ten and the SEC. Uh, And remember the latest proposal that we were seeing with like structure of the college football playoff and the revenue breakdown was going to be that Notre Dame would be kind of in line with the ACC and Big 12 if they did not make the playoff. But in years that they do, they're the one league that gets extra money for actually making it into the playoff that puts them much closer to Big 10 and the SEC. Uh, So they have that advantage going for them financially as well. Uh, Dodd says that money plus its unique access to the playoff are two drivers that will keep the Irish from joining a conference anytime soon. Now, obviously, he's saying this in light of a conversation with Jack Swarbrick. So, I mean, I would just point that out. He Literally just talked to the guy 
who's been the sitting AD there for a very long time. Uh, apparently, we we can read into that. Notre Dame does not seem to be nudged anywhere near a, a conference at this point in time. And um, the playoff is going to give them all the access that they really need. They're not going to have to worry too much about that. When there was talk of, hey, the SEC and the Big Ten could get the automatic two buys in a 14-team playoff, that was one of the things that I thought, all right, maybe that would make Notre Dame be more motivated to join a conference, right? That could have been an ancillary benefit for the Big Ten and the SEC in all of that, in addition to obviously just getting the buy, more money for their conference. That could have been an ancillary benefit. And it's Notre Dame being like, well, we could literally not be, there's no way we can ever be the number one team in the playoff, a top C. There's no way we can ever get this massive advantage of a buy and not having to play because we can't win the Big Ten or the SEC. We're going to have to join one of those leagues to be able to win it and get that advantage for us. Um, obviously, that that is not the way it appears to be going. As multiple reports, Ross Dellinger, who's done great extensive reporting on all this, have indicated that that's, that's not going to happen. There was enough pushback on the auto buys uh, for the Big Ten and the SEC. So uh, that begs the question, with all this realignment, where does it stop? Oh, this is a question. My apologies. This is a question being asked from Dennis Dodd to Jack Swarbrick. He says, that begs the question, with all this realignment, where does it stop, particularly with Florida State and Clemson wanting out of the ACC? Swarbrick said, quote, my crystal ball is cloudier than it's ever been. That's saying something. I don't see a lot of momentum towards further realignment right now. You know, I feel like we read quotes from, who was it? Did Trev Albert say at one point he felt like it was coming soon? I feel like there was another AD or somebody recently, uh, AD or president at one of the major schools that said actually they felt like more was coming. So I guess it really depends on who you ask. Um, But he says, I don't see a lot of momentum towards further realignment right now. There are some schools that if they made a move might change that, but frankly, we're probably first among that, but we're not likely to. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the list. That's probably the list. I guess if you want to say, hey, if Florida State or Clemson made a move, but they appear to be shackled right now and not really able to make a move unless the courts change that. Yes, of course, Notre Dame, if you moved, realignment would definitely happen. So in that respect, I guess you could say, I don't see a lot of momentum towards realignment right now because we're the ones that would be creating that momentum, and we're definitely not moving toward that. Uh, Swarbrick says, I don't see the catalyst right now. The Big Ten and SEC have the assets they need to position themselves for their next media negotiation. And that's an important point that he makes there, right? Like, this is kind of what we said. Like, they're as big as Florida State and Clemson are as brands, they are not additive brands to the Big Ten and the SEC when they have as much cachet as they do with all the brands that they already have stockpiled. Like they don't need those to really cash out in their next media negotiation. Those are not needs. Those would be like, I guess, nice to have if we could get them at the right price, but they're not needs. And Swarbrick says, I understand the ACC has disgruntled members, but I'm not sure there are better options for them. The ACC's legal position is a very strong one. So I don't know, Florida State and Clemson, do you heed that warning? Jack Swarbrick says, I understand the ACC has disgruntled members, but I'm not sure there are better options for them. The ACC's legal position is a very strong one. That's kind of the obvious the obvious take on it is to look at it and be like, well, I don't, I mean, this seems pretty ironclad. I would say that since seeing the arguments that have come out of the attorneys, particularly in the Florida State element of this, it's creative. I mean, going down the nepotism road with John Swafford, the former ACC commissioner, and trying to really dig things up. like They're fighting dirty. I'll give them credit for that. They're fighting dirty and trying to just muddy that thing up. Uh, But on the surface, yeah, it didn't look like they had great legal standing here. So uh, anyway... I guess it depends on how much you want to trust Jack Swarbrick and public comments to Dennis Dodd as to how much stock you would really put in all of that. But uh, that's where we are. Um, That's where we are. And the guy from Notre Dame that is leaving right now and what he thinks about the ACC. I still think it feels like we're pretty far away from having any sort of real resolution on Florida state and Clemson. And I understand why on the surface you would definitely look at it and say, well, that seems to be a pretty, reasonable position for him to have. Um, and it's just another data point to store away. 
one that kind of makes you go like, hmm, okay. Uh, maybe those within what's going on within the walls of the ACC feel like it's it's not quite as likely to happen as perhaps some others would. Because I, I do think there's kind of a thought right now, and I have definitely fallen into this, that like, hey, Florida State and Clemson seem so damn bound and determined to do this. It's just going to happen one way or the other. I mean, what by hook or by crook, whether it's by winning the case, whether it's by private equity, um, whatever it's going to be, like they're they're just going to do it somehow, and it's all going to crumble. But Swarbrick threw a little bit of cold water on that, and uh, maybe it just causes you to take a step back for a moment, take a deep breath, and be like, all right, maybe it's not a complete foregone conclusion here. We we shall see. We shall see. Jay Rodriguez. What's up, Jay Rodriguez? Appreciate you being here. If you want to be like Jay Rodriguez, by the way, uh, click the dollar sign below the chat box in order to join the show. Uh, probably just a couple minutes longer here. This is, I would say, buzzer beater time. A little bit shorter of a stream here being on a Monday, but uh, hope to get back on the regular uh, plan of attack on Wednesday and, and roll from there. Uh, but Jay Rodriguez says, hi, John, the Cougs game versus Texas A&M almost killed me. Uh, it's huge to be a fellow Texas school and attorney. Go Cougs and good luck to the Cyclones. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Like I, I had kind of drifted away from that game because I just was like, well, you know, they've kind of held Texas A&M at arm's length. I don't really doubt Houston here at all. And then I looked down. I had started to do something else. And like, I looked, I just checked the score really quick and was like, Whoa, with, uh, I don't know. A couple minutes left. I was like, all right, I guess I got to watch this. And then I turned it on to watch obviously an insane shot at the end of regulation and got to see most of overtime. And like this, I mean, those are the moments where like having a Jamal shed really helps. Like a dude who's just a complete stud like that an incredible leader, big 12 player of the year. Um, he's the guy for moments like that. And, uh, I think Houston is legitimately national championship good. And most of the time teams on a national championship run, like they, they have one of those moments. They have a game like that where it may not look great. They get really pushed, you know, headed to overtime. They did not have the momentum at all. Texas A&M was the team coming off of the miraculous shot to get there. They've got all that Mo they've got all that Mo, but Houston stem the tide. And when you have veteran players that are really good, you can, you can do that. I think it also kind of underscores not that I don't know Texas A&M's roster well enough to be frank with you to tell you whether or not this was like a huge difference between their roster, but I can point to like a Kentucky or even a Baylor uh, who struggled and got in a really close game down the stretch and lost and had, you know I mean? Like Jacoby Walter, great player, but very young. He struggled from the free throw line. He missed two huge free throws that could have tied the game late. I just feel like when you're Houston and you've got, more guys like a Jamal shed that have been around the block for a long time. You're just more well-suited for those moments, particularly in the sport now that has gotten much older because of the transfer portal. It's so much older in general because of the portal that that really makes it more difficult to win with, with just younger guys that you're relying on Baylor more geared toward that. Obviously Kentucky always is. And John Calipari probably is going to need to change the way that he operates a little bit. If he, uh, if he wants to do that, but yeah, I was super, super thrilled for Houston. You know, to be honest, it's not been the greatest tournament for the Big 12. Um, TCU gets worked. Kansas gets worked. Um, Baylor loses a game that I was very surprised to see them lose. Did not expect them at all uh, to go down at the hands of Clemson. And not only that, but you lose to Clemson, which is Brad Brownell, who's the head coach that one of them anyway from the ACC who was really pushing the uh, – Hey, the Big 12 gamed the system with the net and the way they scheduled their non-conference thing, you know, that ridiculous notion. He was one of the guys that was spearheading all of that. So I, I hated, I hated for the Big 12 and one of the Big 12's best teams and, and best programs to lose to them, but it happens. And uh, I guess for that reason, you'll probably hear it get a little bit louder from some parts of ACC country, even though that that basically that whole notion, that theory was kind of debunked. And the school that they would most point to for all of that was Iowa State, who has looked very good, I think, through the first two rounds. I guess it was a sluggish first half against Washington State, but they they can they can just choke the life out of you, man. They're pretty good. They're, they're going to be a very tough out. I mean, that should be a great game with Illinois that they have coming up. But they've had no real problems, and they were the team that was getting accused of that the most, uh, the way that they did their non-conference schedule from the outside. So anyway, um, but yes, 
happy for Houston. Happy to see them marching on. I was going to look up what time that game is, what day that game is. I forget. Are they on? So Thursday, you've got Iowa State, Illinois in the late game. God, these late tip-offs kill me. Uh, 9.09. I think I'm getting that in central time then on ESPN. Good Lord. I got to wait until 9 o'clock on Thursday uh, for that one to tip off. And then we've got Duke and Houston at 8 30 on cbs on friday at least it's a little better and at least it's a friday those things will will help your boy out just a little bit when trying to wake up at uh, 5 30 in the morning after that but anyway jay rodriguez great to have you here i appreciate you man uh thank you for popping in on the show tonight all right i think that is going to do it for me i will hit you with a video uh standalone style on uh, the pack 12 slash pack 2 um the money that they are getting uh, because the, the settlement details are now the settlement, I guess has been, you could say finalized. We have the settlement details. Uh, they were hinted at earlier, but we didn't get the full details of it. We have that now. And it capped off a pretty good, like 10 day run where those two schools, Washington state and Oregon state in a feel good story, damn it, a rare realignment, feel good story have made out better financially. than it was looking like it, uh, it could have been there for a little while. Uh, but I will get that to you here the next day or two as we say hello to Alan. Alan, glad to hear from you. Thank you for popping in here before the end of the show. Uh, Alan says, John, great show. Uh, what have you heard about your mark talking with Duke joining the Big 12? Uh, planning an epic tailgate party at the next Sunflower Showdown. Your KSU listeners all invited to join. Rock Chalk Jayhawk Alan. Hey, well, if you're if you're going to be in uh, Manhattan next year, I would definitely come by and say, hey, Alan. I would absolutely do that. Um, and I will, I will pass, I will pass that word along to, uh, to everybody. Um, I, I have not heard anything like specifically about your mark back channeling the ACC, but I, I would just piece together what we have seen before and what we remember from the, the saga with the four corner schools that clearly Brett Yormark was working that early and often. Clearly that was something that was a long time coming. That was not like a, Hey, he just made the call down toward the end there. He was, applying some level of pressure himself not just being like hey you know we're here we're thinking about you but like hey come on colorado like what you know you really gonna be i'm just getting the idea i'm speculating here but this is what it felt like there was a little bit of needling like colorado you're gonna let this guy disrespect you like that you're gonna let george Klyovkov continue to make you look silly um and eventually that helped jar colorado loose which spurred everything else like make no mistake about it the way your mark approached it definitely had an effect there so even if it looks like hey you really just got to wait on the florida state and clemson thing and whatever happens with the lawsuit well um you may need to start doing a little bit of lobbying now i duke even could be uh, maybe the sec says look duke's kind of in the footprint and the big 12 is trying to corner the market on basketball we'll take duke for the basketball duke's just right there ready available waiting we'll take them for the basketball and try and keep that basketball brand away from the the big 12, you know, that is something that maybe could happen. So I would try to get in all that you can as much angling as you can on Duke right now and uh, lay, lay the groundwork. You know, these, these things do take time. Relationships need to be built. So lay some groundwork there so that when push comes to shove and you need to act fast, you need to act swiftly. You've already got the inroads there. So I would imagine long story short, Alan, that there still is at least some of that going on. And uh, also in particular, because it's your mark, he loves basketball so much. What better basketball brand is there in the country than Duke, right? I mean, there are very few, <laughs> very few that can compete. Um, so that that's what I would tell you, Alan. That's what I would tell you on Duke. Um, but appreciate you being here, Alan. Thank you for the invite. Remind me about the tailgate before that K-State KU game. I would absolutely love to uh, to stop by and say, hey. So thank you, my friend. Uh, Jay Rodriguez popping in here. Jay Rodriguez, a lot of ACC interest today. I understand why. Jay Rodriguez says, who do you think we could pick up from the ACC if it blows up? I would love to get Miami, Duke, Louisville, and Pitt. I think like Miami, Duke, Louisville, that's like best case scenario. Like those are those would be the, the schools that top my wish list. Probably, you know, Miami, I know I've, made plenty of fun of Miami for what the football program has become and how underachieving they have been. They're still probably tops on the list just because of the football cachet that they have built up. Even if it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, 
how long has it been since the eighties, 50 years ago? Well, um, however far we have to get back there. I, I still would have Miami at the top of the list because of that, but then Louisville and Duke would be amazing for the basketball. Um, would very much, very much enjoy that. And Pitt, you know, I don't know. Like Pitt seems fine. Uh, nothing against Pitt. Just seems okay. It, I would love to have the rivalry game with Pitt and West Virginia in the conference. I guess at that point to me, it becomes if Pitt is not going to dilute the financial number that is going to come to every school there, meaning that they would have to still be, if not additive, keeping you at the same payout per school, like not lowering, for instance, what is now $32 million per school. Then sure, Pitt can come along too. Pitt can come along too. Um, major metro area, some history in football, um, but just kind of so-so now. Not going to add a ton to the basketball prestige. Um, yeah, those are kind of my thoughts on on Pitt. Pitt would be fine, but you, I think you nailed it with Miami Duke Louisville. Miami Duke Louisville would be wonderful. I'm I'm loving the idea of that, loving the thought of that, and would definitely uh, take those three in for sure. And Rob, a lot of people beating the buzzer, some buzzer beaters. Uh, Rob, Rob says, uh, any thoughts on the Josh Pate comments about the portal getting insane? Uh, yes, shout out to the Batcats, nine straight. K State baseball's won nine straight. They're in the top 25 now, and they're in first place in the Big 12. Love to see that. Shout out to my guy Pete Hughes uh, for the job that he is doing there. Uh, my thoughts are, I, I, frankly, I just get nervous because I think if you're a fan of any school that is not a real power, um, not just a school that's in the Big Ten or the SEC, but even if you're in the Big Ten or the SEC, but you're not a real power, I would be very worried about my roster getting poached. You know, Josh Pate's point was basically like, it's going to be a really crazy spring portal because all of a sudden now the one-time transfer rule is gone. So it's just a free-for-all. Anybody can transfer whenever. Tampering seems to be at an all-time high. And he said he's been told, like, there are coaches out there at high-level programs. He didn't name them. He said at high-level programs who have already – Basically, they know like, hey, I, this guy's going to leave. I'm not going to have this guy past spring. And I know who I'm going to backfill with from X school, like that they already have that in their head so that it's going to be crazy. There will be big names that move. There will be a lot of schools that get really victimized. And he said this will be a necessary period for change and for getting some sort of I know people hate the term guardrails, but some sort of guardrails to change how we do things so that, you know, but basically what you're talking about is collective bargaining, like contracts and something that will keep someone there for a certain period of time. Um, because right now, I mean, you just have, yes, it's kind of like a professional environment, but professional athletes have to sign a contract where they can't just up and leave. Basically you got to re-recruit your roster. Like every six months is, is what the deal is right now. So because of that, there's going to be a ton of movement. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm scared like for, as a fan of the big 12, I'm scared. I don't want, guys to leave you know i mean obviously from my squad k-state but even beyond that like you know ollie gordon it was such a big win and I'm, this is not i don't have any info that any of these guys is going to leave but you just think about the stars that stayed in the conference like Fertitta and mcmillan at, at arizona ollie gordon at oklahoma state like Devin Neal at Kansas, guys that all stuck around and were considered to be really huge coups that that they did and um, you know, in some cases like Neil didn't go pro, but other cases like Ollie Gordon didn't take a bag from somewhere else, uh, to go transfer. And I, you got to worry about the big 12 being a victim there because where does everybody come running when they want coaches, whether it's assistants or head coaches, they come running to the big 12. And for the most part, they've been able to hang on to the head coaches. They have not always been able to hang on to the assistant coaches. It's been, I would say they've done a pretty good job at holding on to the players, but if we're going to have a crazy period, you know, that's one of the places people are going to come running because there's actually pretty good football played in the big 12. It's a lot of good coaching going on in the big 12. So when people need resources and they have the money of the big boys, they come to this league. So that that's my reaction. Um, now, is there a part of me that's just also like curious about it and like, Hey, the curiosity in me is like, all right, let I me, mean, let's see what this is going to look like. Yeah, of course. But also it's more, there's there's fear and nerves with that and i think that that's just the way that it kind of has to be at this point but it's a good question rob good question andre shout out to andre i'm not seeing uh, a question or comment attached here andre I'm, i checked the regular chat too if i'm missing something let me know real quick um 
But Andre, I, I thank you very much for your support of the channel. Thank you for getting in here and beating the buzzer. And uh, thank you for everybody who contributed to the show tonight. Uh, really do appreciate you. Great to talk to you guys. And I, I appreciate you guys making room for me on a Monday. You know, not a typical night when I'm doing a live show. So thanks for working with me with the tournament games uh, this week. All right. Appreciate all of you being here. If you could like the video on the way out, I would really um, appreciate that as well. It really helps me. Leave a comment in the comment section. I see people grumbling about Miami and the Big 12 here. Let me know in the comment section of the video, like underneath the video, what you think about Miami to the Big 12, how realistic that is. That also helps with that YouTube algorithm. Uh, head on over to Venmo. If you are not watching this live, uh, John Deskertz-4 on Venmo to contribute to the channel there. And if you leave me a question or comment there with your donation, I will read it on the next show. So plenty of ways that you can contribute. Uh, word of mouth, spread it via word of mouth, via social media to friends, family, other fans of the Big 12, other fans of your school, Facebook, Twitter, threads, Instagram, wherever it is that you're on social media. Let the people know. Let the people know about this channel as continue to grow it. Like my guy, Scott, K-Stater in Florida. What's up, Scott? Um, greatest show, one of the buzzer beater. Scott, you got it, man. You got it. That is a that is a, a true buzzer beater from Scott there. Right before the end, uh, everybody give it up for Scott. Shout out to my guy, Scott, for uh, being here on the show. Thank you all. Uh, take care, and I will talk to you soon.